my name is Jill Coyle and welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce, where we talk the nitty gritty aspects of divorce and help each other come through this not only surviving, but thriving. I'm a divorce attorney and I'm interviewing other experts and people just like you who are going through or have been through a divorce so you can have the latest and greatest information on all things before, during, and after divorce. Let's dive in. Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of No One Dies From Divorce. I'm so excited for today, and I am going to guess everybody else that's listening is very excited because, as you guys know, um, my personal story was kind of laid out there um, from my point of view in my book, No One Dies From Divorce, and um, it's a story that doesn't just involve me. It actually involves my husband, Ryan Coyle, and he's here today. Hello. Everybody, I'm so excited for you guys to meet him and to give him an opportunity to kind of tell a little bit of his side of the story. Um, What most people probably don't know is when I wrote this book, I had kind of talked to him a little bit about sharing our story, but I don't think he recognized or realized how how vulnerable I was going to be on the pages to really... um, I guess I really wanted to help my clients or my my readers understand that I knew what it felt like. And so I think I think that was a little bit shocking. Um, And now our story's out there, Ryan. Yeah, things were uh, looking back, things were on the brink. On the brink. That's a good way to put it. And so today we're going to be able to share and get to know Ryan a little bit and give him an opportunity to share his story a little bit. Um, This is just a quick story about us. When we were in marriage counseling, um, this was years ago, one of the books that our marriage counselor told us to read was Brene Brown's um, Braving the Wilderness. Is that the one that she talks about her, the swimming with her husband across the bay? I think it was Rising Strong. Rising Strong. Anyway, so we were reading it. Well, actually, Ryan read it and was like, you need to read this. Twice. And was very, um, really, really wanted me to read it as well. That was, it was actually an assignment from our marriage counselor. And um, I was really busy. And so I just didn't. And Th- Three months. Three months. And one of the things that Brene, when I finally got around to write, read the book, is she talks about this experience where, um, you know, the stories we make up in our head about what the other person is thinking. And I... I, um, if you haven't read the book, you should, it's amazing. And it's really good. Not only in your marriage, but just in your personal being, you know, being a better human being. But, but one of the things I recognized is just that, um, a lot of the problems we have in marriage is because we make stories up in our head of what the other person is thinking. And I, you're a pro at it. I'm a pro at it. I am. I, I, I internalize things and I, I do, I, I, I'm a litigator. I'm an attorney. I want to think three steps ahead. And so I, I, I kind of in our marriage have, <laughs> have <laughs> done those three steps. Sure. It's kind and of fun because there's like three people in the argument, you arguing, me arguing, and then you arguing about what you think I'm thinking. Right. Right. And so it makes no sense. And a lot of times when we get down to it, what we're actually fighting about, it really is not the story that I made up in my head and we just have to break it down to what we're actually feeling. And that's where Ryan and I really have, um, worked on it in our marriage is our communication and we're not perfect as you can tell, but we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, so everybody, let me introduce you to my husband, Ryan Coyle, Dr. Ryan Coyle. Um, I have to say that. So Ryan is a, um, a medical doctor. He is a hospitalist. And we tell every, he tells the people all the time. He's like, yeah, I'm a hospitalist. And she people hates don't, when I do that. I know. Cause she's like, nobody knows what it is. Nobody but knows what a hospitalist is. But if we don't is. use that term, nobody is ever going to know what it is. <laughs> so every time I okay. get the chance to say it, I tell people that's what I do. And then I explain, <laughs> essentially, if you have an organ that's failing and you're sick enough to come to the hospital, the ER will screen you. And if it's really bad, they call me and I help fix or turn around a failing organ, whether it be your heart or your lungs or your kidneys or your brain or your skin. Right. 
I treat that and get you better so you're safe enough to go home and have somebody else follow up later. Right. I tell everybody that Ryan is the doctor that you need, but don't ever want to meet. Right. Like he saves your life, literally. And then he puts you on a plan to hopefully get you back home and, and to feel better. But, um, and then if you don't know what a hospitalist is, if you watch the whole show House, he's a hospitalist. That's what he does. That's the best way to know what an internist is. He is, is. but he gets like only the sexy cases. We have those like once every okay. 90 you're days. Right, right. He's doing it every day, which is maybe there's a few people in the country that see just the exotic cases on a regular basis, but we right. see them every so often. Right. So that's what, that's what Ryan does. He's a, he's, um, works here in Salt Lake City, Utah, and he saves people's lives. Um, I admire him for what he does. Some of you guys have heard my story, our story about how we met and what Ryan did prior. When we met, you guys, Ryan was working in the financial world. He was making a lot of money. He was um, studying to take the CFA and he was working in a big hedge fund and he was getting to travel around the country and go to all these events. I mean, he kind of had this life that I absolutely hated. What I say is I had the job that all the Goldman Sachs interns w were dreaming of. Yes. Yes. And he had that and it seemed like that's what he was going to do. And you know, I'd be at home as a, as a newlywed, like sitting there while he's texting me from like New York where he's got like at a party with Snoop Dogg or something. <laughs> and I was like, this isn't fair. I don't like this. But, but, um, one thing that you should know about my husband is he's one of the most, um, caring people I know. He, um, truly does things with the intent to help others. So, um, what, it was like a year into our marriage and you're like, I want to do something more with my life. Yeah, I just, I had made a lot of connections in that first year in the financial world, and I was kind of fooled by many of them into thinking that they were more than just business connections, or we could actually like have a, a collegial friendship, and some people burned me, and I realized I was not sharp enough to be deceiving or trying to get stuff from other people. I, I'm more of a, a giver than a taker. And I realized to succeed in the financial world, you have to be more of a taker. And I kind of had a hard, I remember being in San Diego alone in a hotel room after a conference, just thinking, man, I, I don't want to just keep making money for rich people at the expense of kind of my own identity. And just, that's not who I am. And so right. I, I had already thought previously that I wanted to go into medicine. And I said, Hey, I'm healthy enough again because I'd gone through all those health issues mm -hmm. that I could say, hey, I can go through the, the decade-long trial of, of medical training. Yeah, and so just to put you in context, I had just finished law school. I was out about a year, had my first job, and then my, my husband said, hey, um, let's, let's enjoy this pivot and let's, um, let me go to medical school. And it was tough. Um, 11 years, people. It was 11 years from when we had that conversation to get him through the training, through residency, and then eventually to his job. So, um, but here we are. We made it. It was tough, though. Yeah. And now I get to be the heartthrob for little old ladies in the hospital. <laughs> you are. <laughs> People love you. If you haven't met my husband, uh, he's loved by all. He really is. But it's, it's really the little old ladies who I sit down with and, and hold their hand that he tells me all the time because you know you you worry about your 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 doctor husband and like who's who's hitting on him at the hospital. But he talks about the cute little ladies and how they just love you. And you know why? It's because you just take time with them. You just listen. You've always been a good listener. Yeah, probably. Which is probably one of the biggest th problems we have in our marriage is that he is a very good listener and I'm a very poor listener. Um, not accurate. because I don't want to listen. We should be clear about that. It's because I'm very distracted. Mm -hmm. Is that a good, yep. good word? And um, so my intent is not to purposely hurt by ignoring. It's just that I'm distracted. I tell all the, my people at my work, if you come into my office and you want me to answer a question of yours, I have to be looking at you. If I'm not looking at you and I'm on my computer or doing something else, I'm not listening to you. So they now know that. And that's something that they... They wait patiently and wait for me to look at them. So um, we, can, we, we can always get better, right? Sure. <laughs> so in 2011, 2012, Ryan was in his first year of medical school. 
And I was um, working at a bigger law firm. I was working crazy hours. Mm -hmm. Um, We were overly stressed. You were overly stressed with the um, going back into school and medical school and how hard it was. And we had just had our second child, which just added everything. And um, we were just in a point in our marriage where it just wasn't working. Yeah, we weren't giving any time or attention to us. And also, we weren't doing a great job of doing self-care or taking care of ourselves as individuals. And it overflowed into our relationship, and we were not tending our garden or taking care (laughs) of of kind of things at home. Right. We just allowed this big crack and chisholm in our marriage where we kept looking at the other person like, are you going to fill the damn crack? And, and by chism, you mean chasm. Chasm. Sorry. Right. Thank you. Oh, everybody should. We should just get this out there. Everybody knows that if you know me, I say words and sometimes pronounce them wrong. Or you mean one word and say it completely different. Right. And so it's become a little joke in our marriage where um, we now um, Ryan just says, I speak Jill. So if he's with me and he I say something that was intentionally supposed to be something else, he just corrects and and people laugh and it's funny and it's just shows my raw human nature and that, you know, I can be this big, powerful and strong attorney and I still have my weaknesses. Oh, I, I love it that you just, you finish sentences <laughs> unafraid, regardless of what words you're using. We just, you know what? It's good. It's, it, it's just, it shows my intent that I'm real, right? Sure. No editing for us. We don't edit out the funny words. We just laugh about them and move on. Yeah, so we were both exhausted, kind of working and studying really hard, and um, I remember feeling lonely and isolated. Um, I've never had more phone calls with my dad Mm -hmm. ever in my life. I was talking to him quite regularly, um, just about feeling disconnected and isolated and alone, and not feeling that, you know, if, if... if I'm not getting any positives from being in a relationship and it's more of a negative, I was kind of doing this daily or ongoing weights and balances of, of our situation. I just felt that I didn't see it getting, seeing a future of a lot of things in the positive category. Right. And see, I just, I'm the kind of person that I just put my head down and I thought if I ignored it, it would just go away. We did that for like two years. <laughs> Well, we we kind of had to. Yeah. We had another kid. But but um do you remember the day that you just were like I'm done? Um Yeah, I, I it, it was probably over a course of a week to kind of get the guts to to say or actually do anything and and coordinate packing things up and leaving the house. I think what was the, that was what's the crazy is that you don't make rash decisions on anything. I Mm -hmm. mean, we bought our first car and it took Ryan like two months. It was like methodically thinking about it and going to different lots and negotiating with different dealers. And so there was never like a decision that I was just like, I made it, I'm done. And that I remember when you came to me and you said, I'm done, you moved out the next day Mm -hmm. and I just, I mean, it just took me back because I was like, wait, 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 you're sure? You're sure, sure? Like, this is what's going to happen. And it really, I think, rocked me to my core. Yeah, I I remember we didn't even have, like, a big fight about it. It was more just a kind of a a solemn suffering situation where I spoke my truth and you got really kind of quiet, which is not normal for you, and <laughs> and withdrawn. And I think I remember the words you're using is... is just that you kept saying that's not, it's not fair. Right. Right. And, um, literally I went to work the next day and I came home and he had moved all this stuff out. And I mean that, that's when I realized this is real. And, um, it was really hard. Mm -hmm. I celebrated my 30th birthday that, um, that year. And I just celebrated my 39th. So it was, um, you know, we, went through a couple months of the separation and it was hard. I remember one example I, I use is, um, your brother was getting married in Dallas and, um, you know, we were separated. So you were planning on going with the kids and it was one of those things where we were like, well, maybe you shouldn't go. 
um, because that would be awkward. So you made the decision to take yourself and our kids, our young kids. I think what Lexi was three and a half and Max was baby mm -hmm. to Dallas for the weekend and for four days or whatever without me. And you and drove, I drove, you drove there. Oh, with two kids. And I, that was tough, but, but everybody's kind of heard my story about it because, you know, obviously I was at home, like should have been like living it up without having two kids and being able to, like you said, fill my cup and what do I need to, to rejuvenate myself. But instead I just kind of sat and wallow and, and pity and wanted to play this victim role. But what was that for you having to like all of a sudden take your kids by yourself and, and kind of experience that? It wasn't f fun or something I was like looking forward to, but I felt it was important to make a statement or make it clear that this was real, that this wasn't just like a, a trial period, but I, my intent was to be divorced and I was going to start living life as though that was going to, was imminently going to happen. And so it was, it wasn't, it wasn't to harm you or play a game at all. It was, it was more just, Hey, this is going to be our life now. And I was so mad at you. <laughs> I was so angry. I, I, I talk about this in my book is that I, I was so angry and I couldn't allow my anger to, I was allowing my anger to really create this narrative, this story in my head. And I just wanted to punish you. Yeah. I think I, think I remember you. stepping outside of my sister's house while I was down there and having a phone conversation where you were just yelling. Yeah. That sounds about right. I had good support while I was down there though. People yeah. helped with, with Max and, and bottles and yeah. keeping the kids safe. You've got so. a, you've got a great family mm -hmm. and they were, they were willing to step up and support you mm -hmm. if necessary. So one thing you have to know about Ryan too, is when he does make a decision, he's usually it's done. Like that's y the decision. Usually, almost, almost always, almost <laughs> always. So, so tell, tell the listeners the story behind you deciding to jump back in and, and fight. Yeah, so I lived in a incomplete extra apartment that um, that my mom and stepdad were renovating, and I don't even know if I've heard this story. So this spent, is, are you on the edge of your seat, everybody? I spent lonely days outside of med school, binge watching. I think I watched that was the first time I watched Game of Thrones, mm. and you know watched other. TV dramas and would just stay up late, like two, three in the morning, just watching TV and then mm -hmm. trying to go to sleep. But it was very quiet and very lonely. And, you know, I had my mom as a, a sounding board and, and she was very just kind of calm and patient. And then one day sat me down and said, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this. And she had an article that she had found from, I think, the New York Times that just talked about the idea that the grass really is hardly ever greener on the other side. And it spoke specifically to relationships. It was a, um, a psychologist talking about how oftentimes we're looking elsewhere for things to be better or for things to, um, change or, or benefit us. And in relationships, it's rarely the case that it's the other person or a potential other partner that could solve all your problems. It's usually, looking within um, to find what you need to be, but also need from yourself to show up in a relationship. And it was just a, I think it was just a four page article. I read it. I remember sitting on her couch, you know, and she wasn't, she was playing kind of as neutral as possible. She wasn't saying full steam ahead on the divorce, but she um, also wasn't saying, you know, you need to get back with, with Jill right now. Um, but she said, you need to think about this and think about, how you've shown up and if you've given it your best effort. I remember her saying almost like a, 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 a pep talk or a coach talk in high school. I, I had a couple of those from her just saying, Hey, have you really given it your all? Are you going to feel regret down the road? If looking back, if you hadn't given this relationship with the mother of your children, everything that you can. And pretty quickly within, I'd say that morning and afternoon, I thought about that and, 
it was, it was either later that afternoon or the next day that I, I went back to um, our basement apartment. <laughs> and I remember the, the divorce papers were sitting on, remember that, that uh, Ikea cabinet we had put all of our, our uh, bowls and right. extra silverware in? It was sitting on top of that, and we had a discussion that was open and frank. It wasn't even a discussion of, hey, I, I'm sure I want to jump right back into this, but it was more of a, hey, I think I want to try to show up as as well as I can to give us a chance, but right. mostly to give me a chance to make sure that by putting in my all that, A, I wouldn't feel regret if it still ended, but B, if I could change the scenery of us by showing up differently. Right. I remember too, like I kept thinking like Ryan and I could be so powerful together. And I kept wondering why we were tearing each other down instead of building us up. And, um, you know, through, through this process, what I recognized is that just what we kind of touched on earlier is I was unhappy myself. I was not filling my cup. I was, I was not understanding that. And I, I, you know, chapter four of my book is you don't need your partner to be happy because I just kept thinking, when are you going to make me happy? And that's, I think the one, the biggest myths that we have in marriage is that our partner is going to be the one that lifts us up. It's going to be the one to pull us up when we're, when we're unhappy and it's just not. So it has to be that we stand up on our own, that we find that happiness and that fulfillment within. And then the marriage elevates it. And, you know, we, we've looked at our past and we've had some really hard challenges, um, that we've had to overcome. And so of course, sometimes one is going to be a little bit lower and we're going to have to, you know, be like, I'm there for you. But, um, I think in the end, what saved Ryan and I's marriage was that we both decided that we were going to put the work into Mm ourselves. And then if we put the work into ourselves, then we were going to see if our marriage was going to be able to be worked on. And it's an ever growing process, um, to work on ourselves. There's so many times that I just, it's, I don't have enough time for that. And we forget about that. And you see it creep into our marriage, um, of us just sitting there waiting for the other person to, to do something. Sure. And I think before we move on from kind of that, those dark times and talk about the work that we put in, I, it's important to note that we never were like launched these horrible negative attacks on each other. There was never, even though we might have arguments, they weren't like demeaning fights or we weren't tearing each other's character down or tearing each other down. We just, at least to each other's face. <laughs> Well, you may, you may have been angry, but we weren't. I was, I was hurt. We weren't, we weren't throwing these like toxic, you know, anger missiles at each other. It was, no, it was more. I think, and that's a testament to I think we were really just suffering individually and yeah. not finding happiness on our own and not navigating, you know, that the our very busy lives, but also mm-hmm. our very lonely lives at that time. Right. And right. then I, I I vividly recall though that I was adamant about making it clear that as we worked on us and on ourselves, that I was still going to have me time and even time with my friends. Mm -hmm. So I I had made a good group of friends in medical school that um, I felt it was important to be my best me. I needed to have connections outside of of our marriage that initially were a place where I was running to when we weren't doing well. But I also realized it needed to be, I needed to have kind of a, a fuller, rounder, personal life right and you didn't you weren't excited about that either Uh, uh, you know playing basketball five nights a week was not my idea of a little bit of me time I don't know if it was five nights a week Uh, you played so much in our early marriage it was like intense anyways and and I remember like me time should be with me right (laughs) (laughs) one of my love languages is that i like quality time and so ryan knows that now and he makes time for me sometimes just sitting with me watching tv is enough for me yep so um ryan's love language is not quality time he he needs physical touch and and um and words of affirmation Mm -hmm. um not necessarily public words of affirmation either, so you don't need to <laughs> jump into that too. But I do, I do love you, and I do love the man you are. Um, just so everybody understands too, one of the things I learned, lessons I've learned from them is I remember going through a divorce and being so angry and thinking, oh, I want to hurt him with our kids. 
And I remember having that distinct thought. And now, you know, being a divorce attorney for 13 years, that's exactly what I coach my clients not to do. But I do want you guys to hear this is that you can be a bad husband or, or not a good spouse, but you can be a really good parent. And, um, and I want everybody to hear this because Ryan's like number one dad. And I know that, um, he's just so good to our kids and so good to meet their needs and what they need from him. And so, um, looking back, I recognize that I was allowing my emotion and my anger to do the absolute worst thing that I could have done for my kids, which would have tried to take them away from you or not allow them to see you or have or, or as much time with you. And, and now I look at that and I'm like, Oh, that was such an immature thing. So if you're hearing this and you're going through this, I know that sometimes it's so emotional and so angry and you just want to be mad at the other person and you want to believe what you think your kids need. But I'm telling you, if you're both good people at the core, even though your marriage is breaking down and you maybe aren't good people to each other, your kids need both of you and they deserve both of you. And at the bottom of the, at the end of the day, I, I, I talk about this in my book. If, if all you guys can agree on is that you want what's best for your kids. If that's it, that's a start. And that's what you should build upon. And you should work on it, that to make sure your kids are taken care of. So, um, so yeah, it was a lot of work. It continues to be a lot of work. Being married is hard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it, do, it doesn't necessarily say, oh, you know, um, that us sharing our story and because we came out, it, it doesn't necessarily mean your story is going to go in the same alignment or what. But what we do want to, I guess, offer from sharing our story is, first of all, there's hope. Second of all, at the end of the day, it really comes down to you and what you find as your self-worth and your value. And knowing that you are worthy of happiness. And, um, and how are you going to find that? You know, how are you going to ascertain that? And I think one of the things that Ryan and I have really put in the work is that we're not each other's competitors. Like we're the most competitive people you will ever know me. When we first started dating in our first years of marriage, we'd play settlers <laughs> with our best friends in Texas. And Ryan always wins because Ryan always is thinking six moves ahead and he just knows he is so good at these strategic games and it would be, it, I would get so mad and we would like, just, we're just really, really competitive people. Do you remember you quit playing the Nintendo Wii with me? Yeah. Cause, <laughs> Cause you got tired of losing. I do. <laughs> and you know, one of the things I recognize is that maybe I'm not like really good at like playing games against Ryan, but I am really good at being his cheerleader. And I, you know, the, I have other things that I can find value in that helps you. Um, and then Ryan um, is really obviously my advocate in everything I'm doing. Um, I don't think I could be the person I am this, you know, the strong, like very, I guess I'm like, what do you call it? I'm fearless. I'm fearless. I'm, I am, um, strong willed. Um, uh, unabashed. <laughs> unabashed. I don't think that um, a woman without limits. <laughs> well, I could go on forever. I know, I know. But she believed she could, so she did, and and that's kind of how I live my life. And I don't know if I could have a better um, partner to support me in that. And I do. I have my flaws, and I am really busy. And and sometimes I, he just you have to remind me to look at you and finish your sentence. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That was a really good way of doing that. So as our story, you know, um, came about and then we were able to kind of do the work. It but it was a lot of work. We went to a oh, yeah. lot of therapy. Yes, we did. Um, we did I think a you mentioned self-improvement this, course. Uh, you, you mentioned this in the book that you were expecting the therapist to come to your rescue and tell, tell me all the things I needed to do differently. Do we want to talk better. about your socks? Because I, I talk about it a lot. Sure. We can go to that in just a second. But... But I, re I recall very vividly these first therapy sessions where you were ready to like get this therapist on your side and start going at me. And it was, it was apparent that we both had stuff to work on. Right. But Curtis very quickly was like, uh, Jill, do you hear yourself? And do you see what you need to do differently? And oh, you yes. hated it. There were weeks where you were like, oh, yes. you didn't hate him, but you hated what he was asking you to do and putting you through and saying, hey, I need to look at things differently. Oh my gosh. It's so true. And I was, 
yeah. I, I, I was letting so many little things bug me that I wasn't being able to see the bigger things. And then Ryan was getting so sensitive because I was always nitpicking on the little things that he wasn't seeing the bigger things. I mean, we sometimes we get just so focused on stupid stuff. Yeah, it's, we're almost a recipe for disaster. And I think in a lot of relationships, people have this issue where, you know, I, I take any critique that you say, even if it's a small targeted thing, and I tend to generalize it to my entire being. Yes, yes, I always say that. I'm just talking about this one instance. I'm not talking about the man in front of the mirror. But at the same time, I I would always view you in, in the bigger picture and not nitpick at you. So it was almost like I, I was subconsciously or even like passively hoping that you would err on the side of the big picture and stop focusing on the little things like my socks next to the bed. Oh, your socks so, next. And, the, and just so you know, they're still next to the bed all the time. All the time. I think they and might, his shoes. He has really big shoes. I think my socks everywhere. never get to more than maybe six pair. On yeah. The usually floor. cause I asked Paxton to go and pick no, them up. you do that rarely, <laughs> but I think once it hits critical mass, once I can, s- I can't differentiate between like three separate pairs of socks, mm-hmm. I'll eventually pick them all up and, take them in, into the into the closet but you don't know this but when i take them off in the closet i i give myself a little cheer on your <laughs> behalf i'm like hey good job you're taking your socks off in the closet and oh put them gosh. in the dirty clothes oh my gosh but the I, truth is i don't care either way I know. <laughs> and you know that I so know. even though you cared a lot for years about the fact that my side of the bed had dirty socks next to it or my nightstand was kind of a mess which mm-hmm. it still is it still is i I was never going to care enough about what that meant to you in our relationship to ever change that. I know. (laughs) So a couple tips that we did to really resolve this is that he's got his side of the bed and it can look the way it is. And my side of the bed is looks the way it is. We got, we have two sinks. So his sink can look the way it is. And my sink can look the way it is. Um, and then the last thing that we really helped us, um, save our marriage was you do your own laundry because I was done with that. That was a fight I just didn't want to have very often. Because I do it better. Do it better. You do you, and I don't have to worry about it. And it's the best. It's the best of both worlds. So, um, so here we are, fifteen years. I I do have to. We're we're gonna get to some questions because one of the one of the things we wanted to do is we just want people wanted to know from Ryan. They hear me a lot. So. Um, but one of the things stories is when I went out on my own in 2014, um, this is just, I have, I have to say this out loud because this is one of the most amazing and uh, inspiring um, moments of my life is that when I went, when I was about to leave the big law firm where I had, you know, security and, and insurance and here we are, I was pregnant with my third child. Ryan was just finishing medical school and about to go into the match has no idea where he's going to go. He says, you know, Jill, why don't you just start your own law firm? Mm -hmm. And I just remember being so scared. I was like, I can't do that. What, what does it look like? And, um, you were there every step. Like he went to the meetings with me. Ryan came to my work the morning I decided to, you know, tell everybody that I was done and was there when I sent that email out to pack up my stuff and to walk out. And he went to Verizon to get my first phone number and he, he was there. I just, I just remember that, um, that you were such a support. I couldn't have done it without you. Um, and, and then if you guys don't know, when you match for medical school, it's like this residency residency. It's like this absolute bizarre, algorithm that they you could like, end up in many different places many different places and you have to interview and it's like it it puts families they have no idea where they're going they could be going in the middle of nowhere Our, we we thought for sure i was going to get into the montana U- no university of new mexico oh yeah yeah yeah. and so we were like okay that's a i remember us talking it through that oh i can just come back on the weekends on southwest flights yes because we were this building we were coil through. law and I, our plan was <laughs> keep you and the kids here in utah and i would go work during residency and find two to three days off every 20 days and come home. And we knew that we were going to have to just make this work because my family was here. We knew that I have more help here and we were like, we'll make Ryan's and, 
And you said you'd, you know, every other time you'd bring the kids down for for 48 hours. Right. We were planning we, we were, this two-bedroom We were just going to make it work. And I was so scared. And I was like, how is this going to work? I was like, this is just not, this is just going to be crazy. And honestly, those conversations we were having in our head and now going through residency were completely ridiculous because you never got three days off. Like, Oh, it would have been horrible. Oh, it would have been horrible. And, um, and with Ryan being such a good dad, you being away from the kids that much would have just been horrible. But Ryan worked his absolute ass off. And um, was the only person in his medical program to match at the University of Utah for internal medicine. Only person. And um, he got to stay here. And if you know the medical journey, that usually doesn't happen. Um, you usually have to move. All of his friends had to move. And um, all over the country. And he did that for our family. So I'm not as aggressive as Jill in, in asking for what I want. But there were many months where I shook the right hands and talked to all the right people to <laughs> so good. strategically so good. and everybody beats loves him. So he just needs to do it more. Me, I'm like, I'll, I'll talk to anybody. I just wish I need a little bit of Ryan. Um, but, but anyway, so I love you. Love you. Thanks for always supporting me. And Is then it? through this crazy journey of exposing our like most raw, vulnerable story to the world in a book and now on a podcast. So, um, I love you. It's great. Thank you so much. So let's get to some questions because we um, we posted on our social media from people that wanted to know a little bit more about what um, about our marriage. Hopefully, what, it's simple things like what music did you just listen to? Or <laughs> no, oh great, they're actually really kind of. But this is where you shine, um, and so we're gonna we're gonna ask these questions to you, and you get to you get to answer them. So, first one. Define hard work when it comes to marriage. I think we've touched on it a little bit that it, in any relationship, it all starts by looking inward before you can be who you need or want to be going out to, towards the other person. <laughs> and we were not good at that in our dark times and in our separation. And which is crazy because we're very hard workers. Like and both of us are very we're hard caring workers, and, and we're yeah. we're unselfish, considerate people that like to serve and help others. But we were not in the mood to do it with each other, right? And the hard work was being vulnerable in recognizing how I think lonely is the the strongest word I could use. That lonely and unhealthy we were as individuals at that time. That we weren't taking care of ourselves. We mm -hmm. weren't. We weren't doing things, not just, not just like pampering or, or like you mentioned basketball, but me playing a lot of basketball, but doing things that brought us joy or that we were passionate about. We were grinding away and we weren't taking time as individuals to, to fill ourselves up, to be the best person we could be in our relationship. So that was, that was hard because first of all, we were, um, it takes discipline to go out and do things that bring you joy or enjoyment mm -hmm. on a consistent basis and also being committed to our kids and also committed to our relationship and, and local family. We, we were very, it was very easy to just settle into the routine of, okay, Sunday dinner here and, and weekly activity, yep. A, B and C and picking up the kids. And it was hard to change the patterns that we were in that were destructive to us because we weren't taking time out for ourselves. And even, even just simple things that I learned through therapy of, you know, if, if, if I felt overwhelmed coming home from work or medical training, just spending 10 minutes in the car, you know, choosing either music that I wanted to listen to or just turning things off and meditating and collecting mm -hmm. myself before kind of running from one storm to the other, I had to put in that work of even just doing simple little basic things on a daily basis to help kind of ground myself and find peace in myself so that I could be better for other people on the outside. So that initial work was just recognizing the flaws, recognizing the, the lack of looking and caring for yourself and making the little changes on a day-to-day -day basis to get in the habit of doing better with that. That was hard initially. Yeah. I know it sounds very simple, but for people, we all get in routines. We all get in habits. Some people have very good routines and habits that they get, they get into. You know, we see people that are able to work out five days a week or eat healthy six days a week. Or, mm -hmm. you know, we both follow the rock on social media. That guy is like super disciplined with his routines, but we also, 
as human beings tend to get into bad routines and we were in, we had years of bad routines that we're right. trying to get out of. And just those initial steps of, you know, I remember our therapist talking about just, he, he said, just even if it, if you want to stop at a park or even if you can't get to one and you just sit in your car, give yourself 10 minutes to disconnect from the, the world you're leaving with training or work and before going, going home and being with the kids or with your spouse to just do whatever you want to do during those 10 minutes. Right. And I remember a lot of it was us making a connection Mm -hmm. because so many times we just put our head down and we're taking care of everybody else. And so, you know, you, have you ever heard that you've heard the saying, you know, stranger in the same bed. Um, and you know, you get to the point where you're, you're in the same bed, but you're, you're strangers. And so one of the things that we had to do and challenged ourselves is we, we had to make a connection, um, day to day. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of the things is when we were early married, you hated talking on the phone and you hated texting. I still do. Yeah. <laughs> but he realized that that was the easiest way sure. for me to connect with you and being able to make sure that we were like on the same page. And so you made, you, you know, made the effort. I got a lot better. Yes. Like I, yes. I know you maybe take it for granted nowadays, <laughs> but part of our biggest struggles were that because we were so busy and I hated connecting on text or even having extended phone calls, we wouldn't connect throughout the day. Right. Hardly at all. And yes. when we started going annoying. through therapy and making changes, I have really stepped up my texting game with you. And I am rarely the one to end phone calls anymore, even if I sit there in silence, which you oddly like to do for some reason. You'll be driving or going someplace and just having me I'm on the phone. connecting in silence. It's just like the aura of us being together. It's and the greatest waste that. of three minutes there is. But... <laughs> I know that you like that, just being on the same airway with, with me. So I, I don't end calls very much anymore. Uh, that's good. It's good. And, and How many times did you call me last night while I was at work? Uh, just a few. Yeah. It's all good. Three times at least, I it's think. It's all good. But he answers. And she knows my tone. She knows I'm busy because I, I just calmly say some short answers. And, I just oh, had forgotten yes, to tell I you am. about today's podcast. So everybody, if you want to know a little bit of my fault right now is I sometimes schedule our lives and forget to tell my husband. About yes. <laughs> and the most fun arguments we have are when you are adamant saying that you did tell me and uh, we both know whose memory is better. I know. But I do put a lot of things on the calendar and you don't look at the calendar. That's true. I'm not very good so, at using a calendar. So there, there's... Work that can be done in that area, my love. So there were specific little things to our routine and our day-to-day that we had to change. Um, But then the work of kind of finding peace and happiness within ourselves was was important, right? Right. That we were playing this polka dance, right? Yeah, that's what they In pointing out the flaws in each other or expecting the other person to step up. And we weren't stepping up. Ourselves. For ourselves. Not Mm -hmm. just in our relationship, but before we could be who we wanted to be as together, we had to start stepping up for ourselves and having peace and security with ourselves. And because if you're anxious about yourself or your own identity or your own happiness, you're definitely not going to be, you're definitely going to be anxious in a, in a relationship as well. Right. And, right. Uh, and I'm not talking about my social anxiety. I'm just talking <laughs> about our insecurity with ourselves was leading to severe insecurity in our right. relationship. And again, it's like a snowball and then it cu- starts creating doubt and distrust. And then eventually the story we create in our head that Brene Brown talks about so much. Um, her favorite, my favorite story of Brene that she says in her book is about the ham roll. When her husband comes home, she's like really stressed out about something and he's looking in the fridge and he says, man, we don't even have any damn ham. And she's like, creates this huge narrative in her, like, is he saying I should be going to the store to get ham? She goes in, confronts him, and she's like, why don't you go get your own damn ham? And he was like, wait, where did this come from? And it just became this narrative that she created this story that he said that because he purposely wanted to hurt her feelings. And it wasn't that at all. So the stories we tell ourselves about the other person are are just that their stories and we need to break those down yeah and i think the ongoing work that we've learned and not perfected yet but learned and are working on is you know there's really like i said before three conversations or three people in the discussion from your perspective yeah but instead of it being what you're imposing on the other person's thoughts you need to be that 
kind of third person stepping outside yourself and looking at why am I thinking this way or feeling this way? It's right. which is kind of a you know, almost like a Zen like thing to talk about where we need to be able to step outside our own thoughts and our own patterns and look back at ourselves and say, Why am I thinking this way about this situation or why am I feeling this? And not not that we have to block those feelings or block those thoughts, but give a space for them to 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 be because they're there. Right. And then use our perspective almost an out-of-body perspective to say why am i thinking that right why am i creating this narrative about jill in my head right what is there about me that's causing me to be insecure or anxious about this situation or this aspect of our relationship and usually you find the answer within yourself instead of projecting it on someone else and i hope you that if you're listening to this even if you're going through a divorce i hope you understand that a lot of this advice can it doesn't need to necessarily be within your relationship, you know, if you're going through a divorce, but a lot of this and what I talk about in the book is about looking inward and using your divorce as a launch pad to pivot, to become a better version of yourself, to become a better friend, a better human. Yeah. And you, you can do this kind of external introspection, looking into yourself right. from a, from a, uh, hopefully an unbiased perspective right? with all your relationships. Like why am I, why, when I get around that certain friend from my childhood, do I still revert and act this certain way what is it about my thoughts or feelings around that person that 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 make me show up that way or we have the same arguments or the same interactions or what is it about the sibling that I get along really well with or the one that I don't get along well with what am I what narrative is going on in my head or emotions going on in my body that maybe because I just got in a routine which we do or a habit over decades of time that I keep telling myself the same story yeah why why am I doing that? What's the source of, of those thoughts and those feelings? And then, you know, there's going to be some truth to it and some, you know, our our brains tell ourselves stories usually to protect ourselves or to make ourselves look good. Right. And so you can kind of get to the root of why you're usually acting that way. And that's where change comes from is understanding how you're showing up in relationships, why you're showing up that way. And then you can start making small changes to, to show up differently. Right. And sometimes it's, um, you know, using these trials and these tragedies to really get down to that place where you want to make those small changes. And then it's going to lead you forward to a better place to where you can have a better relationship in the future. Um, and you know, clearly our story took us going clear down to the bottom where we were laying flat on our face to be able to recognize what we needed to do to stand back up and stand taller and be stronger. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking about our, our polka dance. So every relationship has its ebbs and flows and its right. gives and takes. And, and I think ours is applicable to a lot of people because, you know, I would become increasingly more passive and withdrawn and you, you would, maybe tell yourself a story about that or or feel the need to fight for more of my attention and connection. And it would be that fight that was usually misguided emotion yes. in, in anger that would cause me to become more withdrawn or more kind of mm-hmm. passive or disconnected to the relationship. So we got in these horrible multi-day or multi-week processes where you would fight for more, more, more and do it in a way that even though I now know the emotion behind it was love and desire to connect and be connected in a relationship. Right. But that's the way what we it, all want. The way it came out was anger, frustration mm-hmm. and negativity directed towards me. Right. And that would just cause me to draw further, become more and more protective of myself. Right. And draw f- myself further and further away. So part of the work has been, you know, and, and you'll recognize this when I say it, you, you don't like it, but I immediately, when I feel your kind of st- going back into that that cycle, that polka dance, I will say, don't do that, or right. stop doing that, right. or I, I label the emotion and say, that's not what you're trying to say right now. Right. And you don't like it because then it'll take five to 10 minutes out of our busy day to then have to process that, right? right. And Brene Brown talks about this and many other you know holistic healings, kind of psychology and, and psychiatrists talk about really taking the time to talk about what those feelings are. Cause if we just get back in our routines, we're going to devolve into kind of the raw negativity that we tend to tend to go towards that destabilizes our right. relationship. Right. And it took a lot of work because I used to think yelling was 
good. And I've learned, I've learned now in 15 years of marriage that yelling gets me nothing. <laughs> right. It gets me nowhere. Because what do I usually do when that happens? Walk away or, 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 or tell me to stop. Or, or there will be like a silent period of hours. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we've really worked on our communication, on understanding each other's. Um, we still use our unhealthy tools, though. We uh, still, from time to time, we um, still get into we're that. We're human. We're so human. So, so the next question that somebody wants to know is, what do you prior t- prioritize in your marriage? Well, when you have four. I don't want to say needy kids because they're not needy, but <laughs> for, for attention, young and they're, they want yeah. our attention all the time. We yeah. have to prior, prioritize them. But I, I do think we're showing them a good example and being good to ourselves where we take time weekly and ki- the kids complain always about us going out on always. a date. Always. <laughs> Every time we go on a date, it's like, why do you got to go on a date? But Can I we come? That's I what, think the easiest my 12-year-old, thing, every time. Can I come? I think the easiest thing any couple can do whether they're wanting to build on gains or improve their the relationship is spending time together doing things you like. We're lucky that we both like dumb TV. <laughs> we do. We we watch shows together We're and big sports fans, big jazz fans. Go Utah Jazz. And and so I, I think that helps us that we get to de stress from the world but also connect with things. And that I'm we trying like. to like golf for you. Ryan loves to golf. Loves it and could go all the time. So I'm trying to like it too, so we can spend more time together. I actually love when I get out on the course and Every we're there together do. and Every it's time fun. But it to get to a place where I can have five hours to go golf is the hardest I'm part. Not, I don't ask for five hours. No. We're not doing 18 holes. I ask you for two hours. I know. Our, our, my favorite golfing trips that we've taken is down to Cabo and we got tacos every three holes. That's my kind of golf. I'll take tacos. So, um, so what matters most when it comes to time and your busy schedule? Well, we already revealed that we're not good at using calendaring and communication, (laughs) so we could definitely be better at that. Yeah. We, you know, when we have these mishaps that sometimes include other people who take care of our kids, like your parents or, or Brittany, our, our amazing nanny, we need to be better at communicating. Yes. And that might even be like a 30 minute sun, Sunday We should evening. do a team meeting like every, <laughs> because one thing you have to know about Ryan and I's busy schedule is every minute of our day is planned out. Like we literally rarely have a night where we get home and there's just nothing on the calendar and we can just like veg. Um, so a calendar is important. <laughs> you should check it once in a while. But we do. We have to plan our lives out. I mean, including even if we want to go on vacation, mm-hmm. it's three, four months out that we have to know that we need that time out and we have to plan. But so the, the frank truth is, was as busy as we are right now, the only way we truly get, you know, 100% focus is getting away, whether it's yes, down, just down to St. George. So I can go on vacation. Yeah. And that's when I get Jill's full attention. It's when I get the authentic, true Ryan, too. It's, I don't, I don't get that very often as well. So our vacation time is precious and a lot of people say, wow, you guys travel a lot. Well, it's the only way we can work as hard as we do to be able to connect and have those, that time together. Um, along with our busy schedule, I think that it's more for people to know we spend time together. We do like, like Ryan and I like being around each Mm -hmm. other. Like we enjoy, like we said, the same hobbies, when we were watching TV, we're watching it together. Like we're not watching our own thing. Um, and which is kind of funny cause Ryan likes some TV shows that I don't like. So we kind of like go every other one on what to watch, but we always watch it together and I always get through it. What was that crazy one? That <laughs> the, the raised by wolves. <laughs> <It's> so weird. <laughs> but, but, um, that's kind of, so we do, we spend a lot of time together and, um, luckily we like to do that. It's fun. So, okay. So another question is three tips for the men out there on making marriage work and having it be lasting. Mm. Um, well, I can, the first thing that pops to my mind is speaking to the example as a, a spouse and a partner to your children. 
um, I think it's important to instill a level of respect for your wife and teach your children how to treat her by how you treat her. Um, I'm, I'm very good at not saying negative or disparaging things in front of the kids. And in fact, calling them out when they ever challenge you or are disrespectful to you, they, I, I don't have to get very stern with them very often, but when they do say something negative to mommy or treat her disrespectfully, um, they hear about it immediately and go correct it immediately. So mm -hmm. I think that's an important thing. Um, I think being thoughtful, you know, and, and, and learning their love language and making sure that you, you know, you don't have to show up every day and, and hit a home run every day, but especially in, in my wife's case, um, holidays and birthdays are, are very important and being thoughtful on those occasions is significant. It, it, it provides peace and harmony for <laughs> weeks and months on end. If it's I, not peace and harmony. It just makes me feel good. <laughs> Being an adult and having birthdays and holidays is not as fun. <laughs> I just want to feel like what I did when I was a kid. <laughs> sure. So finding, but that's part of your love language. Like she, yeah, she really likes um, thoughtful gifts and, Little surprises. Celebrations of thoughtful occasions. So just so that would be learning your spouse's love language and finding ways that you can stretch yourself to meet meet the love language. And then they ask for three things. Yeah. Um again, just being a self nurturer and, and being kind and caring to yourself helps you then to in turn show up as the um spouse and and lover and partner that that other people need if you're taking care of yourself. I think one of the most important things that you've done for me is you've allowed me to shine. You have never been the one to dim my light or tell me I can't or to say that you should be doing this instead of this. You have always been my number one fan and said, if you want it, go get it. Yeah. And I make, you know, me and Ryan process things very differently. I'm, I'm, I'm just a go getter. I, I make decisions based off of feeling, um, pretty good at that. But, um, but you know, some would say it's a little bit more riskier and Ryan has just kind of bit his tongue as he's doing right now <laughs> <laughs> and just, um, and, and said, you just go fly. I'm not going to be the one to keep you back. And I think in any relationship that needs to be just that's so important because um, you should both be able to shine in whatever you're doing in your marriage. Yeah, and, and you've been really busy the last six months, and um, you know I've thought there's there's no there's no sense of 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 jealousy or feeling inadequate or inferior. I think we really are partners in what we both do as individual professionals and. I think your victories are my victories and vice versa. And so I have, I have no qualms with you flying as high as the sun or the stars. Uh, What's the joke that you always say though? You're like uh, about being a doctor. You're like, Oh, I, I, I tell my close friends that it's, it's a little amusing to me that, that my success is, is just an afterthought or insignificant <laughs> when uh, you're uh, married to the success of Jill Coyle. <laughs> And I've reached my dream of being a physician. <laughs> you're, and you're doing it. You're killing it, babe. So what have you struggled with most when it comes to marriage? That's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like, it did say most. So you, I guess you would have to know, like, what was the most? Well, we're both headstrong people and... As successful and driven as you are, I still think I'm smarter and make better decisions than you. <laughs> Did and, you just say that on course. my podcast? <laughs> but I think I think I'm saying it that way because that's that's the point I want to make is that in a marriage, oftentimes you'll think you know better than the other person, mm -hmm. and I th I think the biggest struggle has been we are both. Not 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 thinking necessarily that we are better than the other person, but thinking we know best for the relationship or for mm -hmm. whatever choices we're going to make. And navigating a world where 
there's two two plans and two ideas and two options all the time is where you think yours is always the the right one or the best one um is probably the most challenging part of our relationship and our marriage that that you are very very good and very make very good decisions and you know f- truthfully and I'll be honest like she's made a lot of huge financial decisions in our in our marriage that I would have drug my feet for months to lose out <laughs> on the opportunities that came up especially with housing and buildings and professional mm-hmm. choices you've made and I would have lost opportunities because I would have been dragging my feet right so yes even though I may have thought my my opinion was either more valuable or, or safer it doesn't mean it's the the right or always the best and and not giving up it's not necessarily a control issue it's more just a comfort issue with me liking to do things my way and and believing it's the best <laughs> but then also supporting you and in, in your ways which are many times the best too i know so the next question was how did you overcome that struggle we still <laughs> well i think it's a good struggle to always have right yeah. that if you know it's almost like a a basketball team where you have two all-star players that you know who do you want shooting the last shot well i i want to shoot it but i'm also becoming over the years increasingly more okay with you shooting yes. that shot too yes let me let me be your royce o'neill royce uh, joe I love you. <laughs> what um, do you do to balance your career, support your wife's career, and your children? I think you have to prioritize kind of, kind of your your goals or what you're striving for, right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people in the medical field that are always pushing for more responsibility or bigger opportunities, and you know, I, that may be a there may be a time for that in my life later on but right now your successes and businesses are more important than that and our children and time and and dedication to them is more important than either of those so i think prioritizing things in their time is important but not giving up on things you want to do you know you know better than anyone that i have big ideas and big goals for things i want to do for humanity especially here in utah right but those get to wait until the time is right for for us and for me professionally and then also um you know what the kids need i think we were both very united in dedicating our time and energy to what our children need that's one thing that ryan and i throughout the years have always had common goals is that we've always wanted to help for the greater good we have always looked at the bigger picture of how can we get there to help people, we used to daydream about winning the lottery. Remember that? And we just talk about how we would give away the money and, and to help other people. And now, you know, with our successes, we get to actually do that. You know, we're, we're seeing the, I guess, the fruits of, of our labors and being able to really bless other people. And it brings us a lot of joy and happiness. And one day, that's the goal. That's the goal that that's what we get to do every day. And, um, I love that. That's a common goal of ours. Mm -hmm. So how do we incorporate us time? We've kind of talked about this a little bit, but we, you you just have to be committed to it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm fortunate that on my days off are often when you're working so I can sneak away and golf. Golf. It doesn't take away our time. Not our time, Mm -hmm. but then finding common things, but also being committed to doing those things together. Right. I think the last year has been the best because our daughter turned, She's 12 and a half, and so she can babysit. <laughs> and so it's allowed us to kind of free up some time to go out to dinner. But we used to do late And our night. kids love frozen pizza. <laughs> they truly Seriously, do. they do. That's what they Or macaroni, man. They'd have that every day if they could. <laughs> so it makes So we it can get nice. dinner wrapped up in 10 minutes and out I the know. door. <laughs> but then, like I said, even if we um, don't have, like, some grandiose date night or something, we really do spend time together, mm-hmm. like... Um, and we try to connect that way, even if it's just watching a show together. But we're Mo- together. Most people interested or reading the book don't know because you don't spell it out. But we went on the walks and had the talks for, for days and weeks on end that, that helped formulate each chapter and kind of major themes throughout it. So right. we, do you remember walking yep. throughout the heat in St. George and yep. bouncing all those ideas off each yeah. other? I throw everything off of Ryan. He, and he really helps me with my creative line. Um, so um, he's a big part of this. 
And that's one thing that I've really worked on is using words, us, we, it's not me. It's not I. And I know that. And, um, this is for you. I did the dedication saying that. Yeah. Those are just words in public though. I know, but it's my words of affirmation to show you. I love you and care about you. And I'm appreciative of everything you've done. So the last thing is, and this is a great question because it's funny. Um, how is it being married to a divorce attorney? <laughs> so I have to tell the story. So every time I talk about with a divorce, a lot of times I use an example. If Ryan and I get divorced, it's the worst. It's the worst. Ryan hates it. He hates when I use this example, but I always just say, well, like if we get divorced, our finances would look like this. And I'm like, shut up, shut up. <laughs> Stop saying that. Cause we're, don't put the intent out there. No. I'm just using it as examples, but how is it being divorced, being married to a divorce attorney? I've been a divorce attorney now our entire marriage almost. Uh, people always joke that I'd have to be careful like if we ever did get divorced because I'm married to you. But deep down, you joke about all the time how, how much I would benefit in a divorce. Uh, you would so benefit. <laughs> but also, it's been helpful to see common themes in struggling or ending marriages. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that we see not, not just financial struggles, but power struggles around money that, mm-hmm. that affect people, um, power struggles around children and, and relationship goals that, you know, people just get misguided. And I think it all starts with what I was saying before, that people get in the wrong routines and that kind of causes them to go on different tracks and end up in different places where they get so far apart that sometimes it's hard to reconcile the distance that people have created between them that I see that. And I'm careful and cautious not to allow ourselves to get so far off on different tracks or on that we get separated from each other um, in in different aspects of life. But it's also made kind of given me a very soft spot. You know, part of, if you think back a lot of the motivation, at least, from my side in, in supporting you in a, a lot of these endeavors is initially we saw all these horrible cases of either people getting taken advantage of by their ex who had more power or control or money over them or an attorney who wasn't looking out for their client properly and they got either taken advantage of because the bill was racked up or they just didn't come to, to fight for their, their client and mm-hmm. you were fixing those cases that... I wouldn't say it was half the time, but a good chunk of the clients or the cases you were taking, there was some form of, of people taking advantage of somebody else. And we wanted to not just broaden your, your reach with the number of cases you were doing, but hiring people that could do that as well, that we could help people get divorced the right way, right? Do it, do it in a efficient manner so that the cost burden is as low as possible, but also do it the right way so that they are fought for and get what, what they need. And I've seen so many times that, that you, you and your team have gone to bat for, for vulnerable people in a vulnerable time and really got huge successes for them. And I think not only building your, your team with, with Coil Law and with, with doing as many you know, efficient and successful divorces as you can, but also getting the word out through your, your book and this podcast and teaching people that there are so many resources that you need to reach out to. And arguably, one of the biggest parts of someone's life if they're going through a divorce there's few things bigger than that right right that the birth of a child you know is is a is a momentous occasion but it's pretty straightforward even even a marriage is plotted out pretty well by Mm -hmm. by by wedding planners and family who have done it before but few people are willing to open up and talk about their divorce and guide you through yours if you're going through one And, and few people are willing to reach out to the resources that are there because it's a, you know, as, we, as we've talked about, it's a, sh- it's a shame inducing experience or a, an isolating experience to go through a divorce. And I think people really need to um, reach out and look for the, the, the support and the s- resources that are out there. And I think you are, you've historically been a great resources for individual clients, but now you're trying to show people all the different things that are there for them when they're going through this tough time. And to me, that's inspiring as well. Because even though I like helping people who are physically ill because I get the immediate reward of getting them to Mm -hmm. feel better and hopefully changing their their physical health, you help people change their mental, social, and emotional well-being by going through divorce the right way. Right. And I want, 
I want that to be the message that we spread all throughout Utah and hopefully all throughout the world that their divorce is, is a, a fact of life. Mm-hmm. Many marriages are going to end in divorce, but doing it the right way with the right support and the right resources is something that I am definitely passionate about. Oh my gosh. You couldn't have said it better than my... You're amazing. I, I know that I couldn't do this without you. And you allowing us to share our vulnerable journey, I hope just will help others recognize that there's strength in this, that, that just like you said, divorce isn't the end. It's not the, you know, our, our story could have turned out differently, but what we want to learn from it is that we don't want to use the divorce as an opportunity to, to, I guess, dwindle and shrivel up. We want it to use it as an opportunity to grow. Mm -hmm and become this better version of who we want to be. You know, I, I tell everybody, you know, a lot of times in our broken marriages, we stop dreaming, we stop daydreaming. So dream again, use this as an opportunity to just fly and don't ever let anybody say that otherwise that you don't deserve that. You're not worthy of that. You know, we talk about shame in divorce. The real shame is, is people not kind of living their fullest, most authentic selves. And if you use divorce kind of as a, a crutch or a, a cover, it's easy to say, oh, that this is a hard time or a difficult time. I'm not going to be myself or I'm going to be recluse or hide my feelings or hide my raw emotions. There's more shame in not being who you are right. than in going through a divorce. Right. And you're not doing anybody a service. So use this as an opportunity to just be happy. And I gave you lots of tips and tricks in my book about how to do that and to find purpose and value. So you want final word? Um, I, I rarely get it, so I don't think I'm going to get it. <laughs> you, it, thank you, Sarain. I know that, that this was probably a little bit out of your comfort zone, but um, I just appreciate you. And to all our listeners, just know that um, find yourself, become a better person. Know that you're going to be okay. And we're going to be here every week to help you get through that. Tips and tricks. No one dies from divorce. Thanks, Ryan. Love you. I love you too. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed, please subscribe, follow, and share. I'd love to hear your questions and feedback. You can contact me at community at jillcoil.com. See you next time. I am an attorney, but I am not your attorney. Any advice given on the podcast is general and shall not be construed as legal advice.